This teaching is a little different from what we normally do on YouTube because I'm, I'm doing this teaching along with a WebEx. And the folks on the WebEx are over here to my right. And at times they may have questions and we'll just see how this works tonight. This is a college level short course on the Eucharist, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it. And we're talking about the memorial meal that we celebrate to honor the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is part two of that series. If you missed part one, please go to our YouTube channel, Three Streams TV, the number three space streams, S-T-R-E-A-M-S space TV, and look for Eucharist One. And while you're there, please subscribe, click the bell so that you can get notifications. Well, last time we laid the foundation, this Eucharist One teaching I'm talking about, we laid the foundation about this religious ritual that Jesus commanded us to do on a regular basis. And it's known by many names, Holy Communion, Communion, the Lord's Supper, the Great Thanksgiving, Eucharist. The term Eucharist comes from a Greek transliteration and it just means Thanksgiving. And I explained how I'm not going to get hung up on the exact name that we use, but generally you'll hear me refer to this ritual by the term that the early church fathers used, and that is the Eucharist. I explained last time and went through all of the different scriptures that talk about the Eucharist. And we also looked at what the early church fathers were writing back and forth uh, during at least the first 350 years of the early church. And, you know, they wrote letters back and forth to one another about all kinds of spiritual things. And I think it's safe to say that the early church leaders during the first at least few hundred years of the church would be doing something very close to what the original apostles must have taught. And so one of the things they wrote about a lot was the Eucharist. And one of the things that jumped out at us while we were reading their writings was how they were, they very consistently believed in what we call today the real presence. That means that they believe that the bread and the wine used in this meal somehow, some mysterious way, becomes the actual body and blood of Jesus. One of the other things we noticed was how they seemed to want to celebrate Eucharist very often. I mean, some of them wanted to receive Eucharist, our Holy Communion, as some of them call it, every day. And at the least, they thought that Eucharist should be celebrated during every church service. So we kind of left off in the middle of the reading of the early church fathers. I read most of those, and I want to pick up there. You know, people can say what they want to about the bread and the wine of Holy Communion, but it's obvious from reading the early church fathers that they believed in the real presence. They believed in the body and blood of Jesus. That's what they were receiving. Never in the history of the church was Holy Communion not celebrated at least weekly until years after the start of the Reformation. At that point, there were so many people who were skeptical of the Roman Catholics. I mean, you know, the Roman Catholics had become actually, in a lot of ways, godless and corrupt at that time. And so anything that had to do with the Roman Catholics, for sure, they weren't going to do it. We're just, whatever it is, if, it's, if the Roman Catholics do it, we're not going to do it. And unfortunately, some of them threw out the baby with the bathwater when it came to rites and rituals, including celebrating the Eucharist. Martin Luther didn't do that. You'll still find that Eucharist is celebrated in almost all Lutheran churches every Sunday. John Wesley didn't do that either, though sadly some Methodist churches now have kind of gotten away from celebrating the Eucharist uh, weekly. Many churches recently have made preaching the Word the central act of worship on Sunday. Some charismatics think uh, the central act of worship is <laughs> worship. <laughs> but you know, the early church fathers, they thought the central act of worship on a Sunday was the Eucharist. And many of the Protestants, I think, 
have lost this great command of Jesus, I say, let's get back to what we've lost. We are seeing reports. And matter of fact, uh, Libby and, I, uh, and, and Debbie went to a church Sunday. It's a non-denominational church. But guess what? They, had, they used liturgy. They served communion. And when they served communion, they said, we're receiving the body and the blood of Jesus. We're seeing reports of this all over the world, really, of churches that at one time had rejected the Eucharist as it was described early, and they're now coming back to that. Now, this is how I feel about this. Don't let some fairly modern teaching cheat you out of the richness of the ancient church traditions, okay, and the command of Jesus. In my seminary reading, I don't know how many books I read on the Eucharist, but one of the things that was consistent about the Eucharist was that most who see the real presence in the Eucharist, they have a very mystical view of the Eucharist service itself. They say that the form of the service centers around a memorial meal and that the heart of the service is remembrance, you know, to remember Jesus and his work. But this is the mystical part. They feel like they aren't just reenacting the Last Supper. It's more like we're reliving it or we're re-experiencing it or re-presenting it every time we receive this meal. This is not just simple recalling. It's much like, like the Jewish Passover. That's why they celebrated Passover dressed for a journey and looking like they're about to leave because they were literally reliving, reenacting this first Passover. And so when we celebrate the Eucharist, it's not just us in our building sharing a memorial meal, but all the host of heaven celebrating with us. And our table uh, is somehow, at least many believe, our table is somehow mystically carried into the heavens and the heavens come down to us at our table. And so the, the celebration is a true communion with God and man. One more detail, by the way, that comes from 2,000 years of tradition is you never take communion. You receive communion. Why? Because you do not take salvation or your redemption. You receive those. They're free gifts from God. They come through God's grace. So, in like manner, we receive communion. And I think it's a beautiful symbology that we receive it. We don't take it. Before we dive into the mechanics of the Eucharist celebration, I want to look deeper into two theoretical aspects or theological aspects of the Eucharist. How can it really become the body of Jesus, number one? And number two, what is this relationship between regularly or correctly celebrating Eucharist and healing and health? So here's the question. How can it be the body and the blood of Jesus? Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to look at verses 26 through 28. Matthew 26, 26 reads, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. I must be in the King James here. Let me switch over. <laughs> anyway, drink all of it. So Jesus said, in just a simple interpretation, take his words simply, literally, This is my body. This is my blood. He said it's actually like that. Now, I've had I don't know how many conversations with uh, pastors and believers from some of the fairly new denominations that feel like the Eucharist is all about symbolism. It's just the bread and the grape juice usually they take is just a symbol of Jesus' body and blood. But you know what? That's not what he said. And so the question becomes, how can it really be? the body and blood of Jesus. Well, for nearly 2,000 years, the church, most of them, has just said, it's a mystery. <laughs> and they leave it at that. 
Recently, the Roman Catholics have decided that it comes through transubstantiation. That's the big word they use. That means that the body physically becomes the flesh of Jesus. The wine physically becomes the blood of Jesus. And some even contend if you got a microscope out and looked at it, it would really be flesh and blood, not uh, wine and bread anymore. But that's been relatively recent. For me, that's just way too weird. <laughs> so I just leave it at it's a mystery. And I don't worry about how or why it happens. I just take Jesus at his word. Another scripture is in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 15 through 18. Paul is talking here to the Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 15, he says, I speak... As to wise men who judge what I say, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the, the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body. We are all partakers of the one bread. Look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices shares in the altar? So Paul took this literally as the body and the blood of Jesus. Verse 17, one loaf, he says. It says here in my translation, since there is one bread. But literally, the tr correct translation would be, since there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. I like to use a single loaf in Eucharist for two reasons. It represents the body of Jesus as a single whole. But it's also broken to remind us that Jesus was broken on our behalf. And when I break that loaf, that's called, by the way, the fraction. And we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, remember, it helps me remember that Jesus was broken for me. Some use individual wafers, you know, you can do that if you want to, but to me it just doesn't represent a single loaf, so I like a single loaf. In verse 18, Paul refers back to the Jewish sacramental system, and in that framework, they ate whatever they sacrificed, at least in, in some of the sacrifices. Either the priest ate it or the, uh, the person offering or both ate of the sacrifice. And so the idea that you eat what is sacrificed was a very common Jewish concept. It's just that Jesus took it to another level. But his sacrifice was another level, right? He was the perfect, unique sacrifice for the whole world. So that takes us then back to John 6, John 6, 53. We're going to start there, 53 through 56. Jesus talking to a big group of people, actually. He said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I in him. Jesus said we have no part in him unless we eat his flesh and drink his blood. How can it be the real body and the real blood of Jesus. It's a mystery. Just <laughs> leave it at that. That's what I say. So then that brings us to this next concept or question, and that is, how is Eucharist and healing connected? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to start in verse 27. To me, Paul implied, by the way, that healing comes through Eucharist or sickness and death come through not doing Eucharist properly. And we're going to figure out what we think that might mean. So 1 Corinthians 11, 23, we'll start there. 23 through 26 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remember that in those days, a covenant was established with the shedding of blood. And it's his blood in this case. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then skip down to verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Okay, so this is God's plan for this communion Eucharist ceremony. It's not a potluck dinner. It's, as Paul called it, the Lord's Supper, our Holy Communion, if you like, or Eucharist. It's a ritual celebration. And the earliest records of the church, as we've seen, indicate that all Christians celebrated Eucharist in this ritual way as a memorial meal. And they did it every time they got together. And Paul says, when you come together, do that. Well, what happens if Eucharist isn't celebrated properly? Again, go to 1 Corinthians 11. This time we're going to start in verse 27. Go 27 to 32. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. Paul warns that sickness and death can result from not doing Eucharist properly. That's a stern warning, it sounds like. And it's similar to the warning that goes along with sexual immorality and things like that. You can look at this from two different directions, I think. One is, if you don't do communion right, you may get sick and even die. But I think the other side of that coin is, if you celebrate communion or Eucharist properly and regularly, then you'll walk in a greater measure of health. Look at verse 27 for a minute. The word there in 27 that in my translation is translated unworthy manner. Uh, he who eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner. It says that word unworthy is a Greek word which means irreverently. In other words, not reverent. If I'm acting irreverently, then I'm not honoring or acknowledging the holiness or the God-touched nature of something. I think that Paul means three things by unworthy manner or irreverently. Number one is, I think he meant those who are not serious about the ritual or the ceremony of Eucharist. The second thing, I think, is someone who receives communion with unrepentant sin on their heart or with grudges or bitterness in their life. And the third thing I think Paul could mean there is that they're receiving the Eucharist, but they're not acknowledging the real presence of the body and blood of Jesus. And that last point means not understanding that the bread and the wine somehow become the body and blood of Jesus after it's been prayed over. After all, Jesus said that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have eternal life, right? So otherwise, we have no part in him. That's back out of John 6. There's another word here in this passage in 1 Corinthians 11, and that's in verse 29. It reads, uh, somebody eats and drinks judgment to themselves if he does not judge the body properly. Well, that word judgment there really does mean what you'd normally think of, meaning you get a sentence of judgment on yourself if you don't do this right. 
But what he says is you get a judgment on yourself if you do not judge the body rightly. That word judge there for the body is a Greek word that really would be much better translated or as discern or distinguish. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Acts chapter 15 and verse 9. Acts 15 and 9 reads, And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. This is Peter talking when he's, after he's come back from Cornelius' house and he's explaining how the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And he says, The Holy Spirit made no distinction between us Jews and those Gentiles. So that's the same word that Paul uses there to say if you don't properly distinguish or discern or understand the body of Christ. If you, if you don't do that properly, you're going to be judged. So how do we improperly discern the body or the blood? Well, in my opinion, if we don't distinguish between the common loaf of bread and the body of Jesus, and we just receive a symbol we just receive not the body and blood of Jesus, but a symbol of that. I think we're not properly discerning the body. It looks to me like that will bring on sickness and maybe even death. So it appears that properly receiving the Eucharist prevents sickness and death. And, you know, I and many others are certain that there is healing in the Eucharist. I just can't tell you how many times I've heard testimonies of people that have said, well, I was sick, but as soon as I received the Eucharist, as soon as I received the elements, I was healed. And so I truly believe there is healing in the Eucharist. By the way, I want to show you something out of the Old Testament. I know there's some people going, look, God can't require us to do a ritual meal, and he can't require it a special way, and he sure can't make us sick if we don't do it that way. Well, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 30, okay? And I want to show you an example of people getting sick because they didn't do a ritual the correct way. 2 Chronicles 30 We're not going to read all of the story. We just get the important parts here. Go back and read the rest of the story. It's a great story. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 17. For there were many in the assembly who had not consecrated themselves. Now, I guess I had better set the stage. Okay. So the children of Israel have been in captivity. They come back to Jerusalem and they discover some scrolls. And in the scrolls, it talks about how they're supposed to celebrate Passover every year. And I mean, they tear their clothes, they throw ashes on themselves and mourn. We haven't been doing this. Oh, no, God is judging us. God's going to judge us. We better do this. We better figure out how to do it and we better do it and we better start doing it right away. And so it says some of the many assembly did not consecrate themselves properly. Consecrate means to go through a ritualistic process to make yourself holy or ready for this ceremony. Therefore, the Levites over this slaughter of the Passover lambs for everyone who is unclean in order to consecrate them to the Lord. So the Levites are going to start trying to fix this. For a multitude of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulon, they had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover otherwise than how it had been prescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, through not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary." So the Lord heard Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. The people start doing Passover. They're not doing it right. They start getting sick. Hezekiah the king prays for them, says, Lord, forgive them. And guess what? The Lord hears Hezekiah, forgives them, and heals the people. There are two concepts, I think, that are confirmed in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. First of all, God does institute special ritual meals that we are to celebrate regularly. 
and that we are to celebrate them in a certain way. Celebrating the ritual properly can bring healing and health. The second thing I think we get out of this is if we don't celebrate these rituals as God has intended, then we may become weak or sick or some may even die prematurely. Okay, so much for the theory of the Eucharist. We covered a lot of ground there. I know that sounds harsh, what I've been saying about healing and sickness and doing things right, but I can't help but read what the Bible says. I don't want to cover over that. Any questions or thoughts up to now from anyone? Father Dan, can you give us, you said you've experienced lots of occasions where people have claimed healing. Uh For me personally, stories make a big difference. Can you share a specific example? Heard someone was healed as a result of the Chris? Just a couple of weeks ago on the prayer line, we do, you know, we do a Sunday morning service on the prayer line uh, where we have Eucharist. And Ian, do you remember what it, what it was, uh, how they were sick? They had some pain somewhere. I think it was in their knee or maybe their shoulder. So we'd talked about when you receive Eucharist, receive healing. And sure enough, uh, right after Eucharist, they come on the line and say, hey, the pain's gone. When I received, when I received Eucharist, the pain left. Even I think Abby was having a headache on what was this on Friday. She stopped, she stopped having a headache. That's exactly right. And when we got together for our Easter on Friday, Abby had a headache, and uh, she received healing during the Eucharist. Anyway, that's a couple of stories, Peter. Uh, if I guess if I had time to think about it, I could probably think of dozens, hundreds. I don't know. My worldview is very sacramental. A sacrament is something that a human being does, something natural and normal that a human being does, that God comes into and turns it into something supernatural or holy. The sacrament of baptism is a great example of that. I think holy matrimony is a sacrament. Many, many things we do, we have to do something first in order to trigger or allow God to do his part. That's why prayer is so important. I think prayer is a sacrament. We pray, oh Lord, you know, bring my cousin back to you. That's a sacrament. We're, at, we're doing something human, asking God to do something supernatural in response. So I have a very sacramental worldview. If we appreciate that, if we understand what's there and what's behind it, then instead of just going, oh, we're doing communion again? Okay, this is the bread, the wine, okay, we're done now. You can really think about it. You can, it becomes a much, much more rich experience. And I think that's what God wants us to have. Well, let's talk some about the mechanics of the Eucharist. And if you have a 1979 prayer book. Many different denominations use a 1979 prayer book. They all got together in 1979 and came up with some different rituals and liturgies that they could all agree to. Uh, There are going to be times I may refer to something like that in here. So you may want to have yours handy. I want to talk about the mechanics of the Eucharist, okay? Because we celebrate the Eucharist using liturgy, let's start by diving into the term liturgy. It comes from a Greek word, liturgio, I believe it's pronounced. And it's actually, liturgy is a transliteration of that word. We took that Greek word, we couldn't pronounce it right, so we just said, okay, we'll call it liturgy. The Greek word means the work of the people. It could refer to a public servant, Uh, in public office, and it it can mean prayers, the responses to the prayers, and it can mean the order of a service. Now, again, because Roman Catholics use detailed liturgies for all of their services, many reformers wanted to do as, (laughs) as much as possible anything that was not Roman Catholic. And so they prided themselves on not having any liturgy. But you know what? I've known many pastors from these denominations, had meals with them, will talk about this idea of liturgy. And, oh, we don't have liturgy in our church. 
yeah, tell me how your church service works. Well, you know, we start off with a prayer and then we do the fast song. And then the next thing we do is, is a couple of hymns or songs. And, and the last one is the slowest of the bunch. And then after that, we have maybe a responsive reading of a psalm. Some will say they include a scripture reading or two by someone in the congregation. And then they take the offering. They sing the doxology. They have the sermon. And after that, there is a, an altar call. And then uh, just like Jesus did with his disciples, maybe they sing a hymn when they're all done. And at the end of that hymn, there's always a benediction, some kind of a blessing to send the congregation away. And, you know, so the pastor tells me all this. I go, oh, you have a liturgy, huh? Well, actually, we do have a form of service that's printed out right here on the bulletin. What we're going to do and the songs we're going to sing and stuff. Well, the problem is they can't call it liturgy because that sounds too Roman Catholic. I'm not afraid of that, okay? I'm going to call it liturgy because that's what it is. Liturgy is of some kind, has been part of worship of Yahweh God from the beginning. I could probably give you 50 examples, but I'm going to give you just a couple. Numbers 10, verses 35 through 36. Then it came about when the ark set out that Moses said, Rise up, O Lord. And let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. When it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the myriad thousands of Israel. What they're saying here is Moses said this every time the ark was moved. If you picked it up, he said, Rise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. When it came back, he says, Return, O Lord, to the myriads. This was the liturgy for moving the ark. Turn to Ruth 4. There are a lot of places in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, where you'll see that Moses or Aaron uh, says something, says something to the people, and then the, repeat, the people have a response. Uh, oh, Lord, uh, uh, we're going to do what you say or whatever. That response was probably prescribed beforehand. In other words, Moses said, I'm going to speak to you in a minute. And I want you to respond with these words because that's the way Jewish liturgy works. Ruth 4, Ruth 4, 11 through 12. If you didn't know about liturgy, you might miss the liturgy in these two verses. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathrath and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. You know what they were talking about? They were talking about Boaz taking Ruth as his wife. And so there was a liturgy for that. This is what the town elders said when somebody took uh, a wife like that. Turn to Acts 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts 2, 42. We're going to look at a slight mistranslation in this verse. Acts 2, 42 says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and my translation says, and to prayer. But if you look at the literal Greek translation underneath this, it says they were devoting themselves to the prayers. Prayers, plural, with the word the in front of it. That refers to the Jewish liturgy. Let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13 and verse 2. Acts 13 and 2 reads, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Do you know what the word ministering is there? It's that Greek word, liturgeo, or however it's pronounced. It's the word liturgy. So while they were doing the liturgy is what that would say in modern terms. And that's what New Testament churches do all over the world. The liturgy, at least some. 
Now, modern Jews follow a complex liturgy, of, if they're devout anyway, for almost every aspect of their lives, including they have two separate liturgical prayers for going to the bathroom. You can imagine why you need two, right? In my humble opinion, we humans are designed to worship using liturgy as a guide. We just function better that way, or God wouldn't have introduced it. We've been designed to worship in spirit and in truth, meaning that we often allow the Holy Spirit to move in, around, even outside the liturgy. But when liturgy becomes a rigid structure that you have to adhere to religiously, I think you miss the whole point of liturgy. Liturgy is supposed to be a guide in our worship. It's supposed to be guardrails, if you will, that help us not forget or not miss an important part, uh, help us do a celebration the correct way as they learned in Second Chronicles 30. Liturgy is meant to help us worship together in a rich, beautiful way. But when the liturgy Nazis <laughs> get involved and insist on r rigorous rules, then I think it becomes truly work and no longer a reasonable spiritual service. So we all use liturgy of some kind in our worship. Uh, let's use the beautiful helpful tools and not run away from them, okay? And so anyway, that's my tirade on the liturgy. So I promised you we're going to do the mechanics of the Eucharist. And you can't understand it without the liturgy because it involves the liturgy. The term Eucharist, for some, describes the liturgy of a complete church service. And that includes Holy Communion toward the end. But for many, the communion part of the service, that's the Eucharist. And to me, I generally think of the communion part of the service as being the Eucharist. Let's talk about church service order for a minute, okay? If you've been privileged to attend a Jewish synagogue service, if you never have, please do. It's an educational experience. You'll love it you'll almost immediately notice that their order of service, their liturgy, is strikingly similar to most Christian services. They open with prayer, then they sing some songs, maybe they even dance. They have another prayer, followed by a responsive reading of the Psalms. They always include a reading from Torah, just like in our Christian churches, we almost always include a reading from the Gospel. Usually the reading of the Torah then is followed by what you'd call a homily or teaching, preaching. And then after the homily, they receive offering in two kinds. They receive an offering of money and they receive offering of bread and wine. The service then ends with a song and with a blessing. Now, we know that the original church was made up almost entirely of Jews, right? Right. And it looks to me like these early disciples just took a synagogue service. <laughs> and when they got to the bread and the wine part, at the end, they brought the bread and the wine up. They said, woohoo, this is our chance to celebrate Eucharist and to share Holy Communion. Now, some believe that you can't have an official Eucharist service without the reading of a gospel. <laughs> this is like some of the Jews believe you can't have an official synagogue service without reading the Torah. I believe that some Bible reading is, is needed or best, but you know, I don't want to get too hung up on the rules. So what is the general form of the Eucharist? This service order is ancient and is celebrated pretty much the same way for the last 2,000 years. It's not a show to watch. It's a ceremony for all to participate in. And that's why there are responses from the congregation. We reenact or we represent the entire creation and gospel story. 
starting with creation, going through the fall of man, followed by the gospel, what Jesus has really done for us. We literally relive together with God and with this congregation the history of mankind and how God loves us. This is all done in this mystical space where heaven, the heavenlies and the earth kind of come together, temporarily meet. And Paul also seemed to indicate that the primary purpose of the Lord's Day worship was to celebrate Eucharist. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, 20. Therefore, when you meet together, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? In other words, to Paul, it was like, this is the primary reason for coming together. Why else would you come together if you don't celebrate Eucharist? In a way, especially for the early church, every Lord's Day included a Eucharist celebration. It was a mini Easter celebration. So the order of the Eucharist part of a service looks like this. And if you've got a 1979 prayer book, you can turn to page 360 and you can see some examples of this. Remember that this part of the service is after the sermon, after the general prayers. I believe the Eucharist really starts with the passing of the peace. And that provides a chance for everybody with local relationships to get those local relationships in order. The next thing is the offering. What I love to do, uh, in a, especially in a Sunday service, is receive the offering just like the synagogue does in two kinds. Receive the money and then also receive the offerings of bread and wine. I think it's cool that the Eucharist starts with bringing something of ours to the Lord. Our money represents the fact that we're all His. We're completely owned by Him. Everything we are is His. But the bread and the wine represent our desire to contribute what we can to this miracle meal, giving something natural that He transforms into something supernatural through the sacrament of His body and blood. So that's the offertory. Next comes preparing the elements or setting the table. Water is added to the wine to signify the Jesus side being pierced. Remember it said blood and water came out. So water is added to the wine in the chalice. There are usually then that's followed by prayers of thanksgiving, exclaiming God's love in the gospel, that sort of thing. And I think it includes two significant parts of worship as well. And this is, again, long-term tradition. One is called the Sursum Corda. You'll see in your prayer book, it says that we lift our hearts to the Lord in worship. We lift our hearts to Him in order to enter into worship. And then the Sanctus and the Benedictus repeats what happened to Jesus when He made His triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and they were singing this Palm Sunday, what it would be now to us Palm Sunday hymn, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was code for Jesus, the Messiah. And then we join them saying that we're, we're hailing Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. We're just worshiping God is all we're doing, giving him thanks and worship. Uh-huh. So the Last Supper is just a part of Eucharist, right? Yeah, the Last Supper is the model that we have for Eucharist. And the communion part of Eucharist is just part of that. That's why you have things like you got to bring the wine and the, and the bread forward. Somebody prepares the table to get it ready to receive. Somebody then prays over the bread and the wine. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, that's what we're doing is reacting, reenacting the Lord's Supper. Oh, okay. so, um, or the Last I Supper. I wanted to ask a question, but it's, it's kind of like a technical question. Okay, what is it? Uh, as far as uh, confessing our sins, so it's part of it, the way you confess our sins. Uh-huh. Uh, was it during, when, during the Last Supper, I, uh, I, maybe I'm wrong, I can't remember Jesus saying, confess your sins. So that the, like the way we always confess our sin before we take the, we right. take the Holy Communion. Did Jesus do that? No, he didn't do that. And, and you'll notice that I didn't include that 
as part of the order of the Eucharist. It's normally done during a Sunday morning service, but it's done before the Eucharist. Some folks will start the service. That's almost the first or second thing that they do is have a confession of sins. Others will have a confession of sins maybe right before they pass the peace. And so, although I believe it's important that we have confessed our sins and gotten rid of any animosity, any bitterness or anger that we're holding, Jesus didn't do that as part of the Last Supper. I think he assumed that because he had taught them the Lord's Prayer, they had already understood this idea that they had to confess their sins, they had to ask forgiveness, and they had to forgive others. Because remember, that's a part of the Lord's Prayer, is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. It's the two parts there. And as a matter of fact, the Lord's Prayer is always part of the Eucharist. Yeah. Okay? So, I mean, that, that makes sense. So, I mean, I just wanted to know because the, the, the part, that part of confession is always, is always missed during the Last Supper. And right. We always do it before every time we, we, forget, we say, forgive us for the things you have done, the things you have not done. We always pray that before we get communion. Right. So, that one... The idea of going through a prayer of forgiveness before you get to the Eucharist is something that we picked up from the early church fathers. Many of them talked about that. So we're talking about the, the order here. Uh, after worshiping the Lord, the next thing is what is called the words of institution. The idea is these are the words that Jesus said that instituted this memorial meal. And remember, we're reenacting the Last Supper. The Latin version of this part of the service is where we get the term hocus pocus. Ever heard somebody say hocus pocus and they're talking about something magic, right? In the Latin, the words of institution include hoc est inam corpus minum. And that means this is the body. And so, <laughs> ignorant folks listening to a Latin Mass thought, oh, they're saying hocus pocus. That must be some magic going on there <laughs> at the time. Okay, so the words of institution then are followed by the mystery of faith. That we all say Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The next part of the Eucharist is, so I'm going to give you a fancy Greek word here, it's the epiclesis, and that is the consecration of the elements. That's the prayer that is involved uh, asking God to touch these elements. The celebrant then is sanctifying or consecrating or asking the Lord to do something special with the bread and the wine to turn it into the body and the blood of Jesus. And many are convinced that this is the time when that happens. Some think it happens at the words of institution, okay? We don't know. It's Remember, it's a mystery. I'm, I'm not going to get off on that. The Eucharistic prayer, you'll notice when I do Eucharist, I always end the Eucharistic prayer with something that goes something like this. All this we ask in the name of your dear son, Jesus, by him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father. That was added to the Eucharist celebration early, early on in the history of the church because there were Gnostics and others that had come along with heresies that distrusted or disbelieved the idea of the Trinity or the idea that Jesus was even God. And so in order to make sure that this heresy was swiftly and completely tamped down, they added this part at the end of the service. So it makes sure that we all know we're honoring God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then that is followed by what's called the great amen. That's how the early church fathers, matter of fact, they said that it is amen said heartily. In other words, everybody shouted amen at the end of that. That's followed then by the Lord's Prayer. 
and then that's followed by the fraction of the host. As Gloria explained to us last Friday, when Jesus broke the bread of the Passover meal with his disciples, what he was doing was he was taking that middle matzah and breaking it in half. And then they, there was some symbolism there about wrapping part of it and hiding away part of it. What the Jews didn't understand was that this was a symbol of Jesus and his broken body, this middle matzah that was broken in half. And it was indeed what they were celebrating every year when they celebrated Passover. They were celebrating the foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Turn to John 3. We're going to get to another part of the communion or the Eucharist, John 3. So after we say the Lord's Prayer, after I break the host, the fraction, what do I do? I lift it up, right? John 3, 14 and 15. This is where that comes from. As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. The idea is that we are lifting up Jesus for all men to see, to fulfill this. John 12, John 12, 32 through 33. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So after the fraction, and you see me lifting the elements, remember that the Eucharist is more than just a memorial. It's a dramatic reenactment. And I'm reenacting the crucifixion of Jesus at that point. I'm signifying his crucifixion. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 through 8. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, or with, but with the unleaven of sincerity and truth. You'll notice in there that we have taken these words of Paul and included them in our liturgy. After breaking the bread, we repeat what Paul said here. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, we add. Therefore, let us keep the feast or celebrate the feast. The last part of the Eucharist is, of course, the distributing of the body and blood of Jesus. The cup and the host, once the bread has been consecrated, has been made holy to become for us the body of Jesus, it's not called the bread anymore or the loaf. It's called the host. So we distribute the body and the blood. We receive that. And after receiving Holy Communion, most follow the ancient tradition. In other words, after they receive the body and then receive the blood, most follow this ancient tradition of forming the sign of the cross. A lot of people today mistakenly think of that as a Roman Catholic sign. But as it turns out, it's actually one of the earliest signs of Christianity. The very first Christians... That's how they identified themselves to one another is with the sign of the cross. It's sort of like a handshake. And, of course, you don't have to do the sign of the cross after you receive communion, but a lot of folks do. It's a beautiful form of worship. It's a kind of sign language, you know. Do it in your private devotions if you want to, if you, <laughs> if you feel uncomfortable doing it in public. And let it be part of your special touch by the hand of God, okay? And then usually, uh, in, especially in a Sunday morning service, following communion, there's going to be a song, there's always a benediction, and there's always a blessing to send the people out after that. I want to read one last thing here from the early church fathers before we wrap up for tonight. This is out of the writings of Ignatius. And on the day called Sunday, 
all who live in cities or in the country gathered together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president, that means the one presiding over the service, verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of those good things. Then we all rise together and offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for others and in every place that we may be counted worthy, not that we have learned the truth by our works, but also that we have found to be good citizens, keepers of the commandments, so that we may be saved with everlasting salvation. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. That's passing the peace, okay? There is then brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water, and he, taking them, gives thanks and glory to the Father and of the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Ghost, and he offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at his hands. And when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgivings, all the people present express their assent by saying, Amen. That's the great Amen. And when the president has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons give to each those present to partake the bread and the wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We model our Eucharist after the earliest church liturgies. And some might ask, well, that's just a tradition of men. Why follow it? <laughs> Listen, as far as I'm concerned, if that's what the early church fathers did, I want to do that too. Am I smarter than they are? Can I come up with a better tradition than they did, these who were right there at the time of the apostles? Much like the Passover was specifically prescribed by God. This is how you do it. I think so the Eucharist was in those early days. And so the question I would ask instead is, why would I want to do anything other than what the earliest disciples did? Am I smarter than they are? I don't think so. Well, I want to cover next time a couple of details about communion, like who can work around the table, who can serve communion, and why. And I also want to cover this question that several have asked, and that is, who can consecrate communion? Uh, can it only be priests and bishops, or can it be anybody? After all, we're all priests, right? We're part of the royal priesthood of God. And so we'll look at those things next time.